Hello, everybody. Welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about the number one question was asked. Uh, the most upvoted question was, how do you get fast? How do you get good fast? We're going to be talking about that in this podcast. We're going to go deep in this topic. And uh, please, guys, give me a thumbs up in the chat room. Let me know. Um, either can you shout out my son, Nick Rowe? He has autism and he's your and you're his role model. Shout out to Nick Rowe, my boy, Nick Rowe. Don't worry. Don't worry about autism. Get in the gym. Start training. We're going to use that. We're going to use that gift you have. You have a gift with everything that every, every negative comes a positive. And believe me, I've seen a lot of guys very successful have a touch of autism. Believe me, it's not un, it's not uncommon. So use it. Use that gift you have. Don't uh, let it stop you. Martial arts is so good with guys with um, ADD autism etc guys it's so good to train them it's so good to give them a place to um exercise their mind jujitsu boxing it's all it's all good for the brain it's all good for the body i highly recommend it guys we we're talking about the first i asked you guys for questions yesterday i put up a post the top top question let me read it out for you guys the top top question i got let me read it out right here and it is from a man named Jasper Filardo. Jasper Filardo asked, Do you have any theories on why some guys can progress so fast in sports, Cyril Gunn, and possess insane levels of fluidity while others train their whole lives and can't look like that? More physical or neurological? That's from Jasper. Jasper, I'll tell you something. That's a really great question. That's a question I've been asking myself for years. I'm, I've read so many books on training. I've trained with so many great trainers. I've researched the world all over. And I'll tell you one thing. It has a lot to do with your youth. What you did in your youth. Imagine trying to learn a language in your 30s or in your 20s. Let's say, for instance, you're trying to learn Arabic. Kif halak. Tak Arabic. Now, you hear my Arabic. I don't have an accent because I learned speaking Arabic at a young age. Now, if you try to say those words I just said, and you practice them from 10 years, you would still have an accent. A trained ear would be able to detect your accent. It's similar with athletics. If you learn athletics later on in life, okay? Now, I'm not saying, guys, I learned, I learned martial arts later on in life, okay? I started at the age of 20. My trainer, John Denahar, started at the age of 27. So I'm telling you, there are solutions to these problems. We're going to get to it. we got to start slow. But there's a type of athletic accent some guys have an athletic accent. They move their bodies. They punch and kick. But it's, it seems weird. It seems herky-jerky. It doesn't seem fluid. It doesn't seem explosive. It's herky-jerky. There's an accent. Like when somebody who learns English from a foreign land, they come here, they speak English. You know right away he's from a foreign land. Why? You hear his accent. He asks you for a Pepsi. Not, not a Pepsi. He asks you for a Pepsi. If he says Pepsi... If he's turning P's into B's, he's an Arab. I know right away he's an Arab. My children, they call me Baba. They don't call me Papa. In the French, they say Papa. In Arabs, we say Baba. We don't have the letter P. So when you teach them the letter P, they always have an accent. The B, the P turns into a B. It always sounds like a P and a B. It's a, it's a, it's a strange mix. What I'm trying to tell you is when you learn athletics when you're young, you have an advantage. You definitely have an advantage. Great athletes are usually developed in youth. However, there are exceptions. You're going to point to this guy and that guy. Bernardo Hopkins learned to box at 27. That's true. I trained at 20 years old. I started training. But we did athletics before. Okay, and I wasn't deep into athletics when I was a young kid, but I did. I played sports. Bernard Hopkins didn't work behind a desk till he was 27 and then jumped into the ring. No, 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 no. He was probably a street fighter. He was probably a troublemaker. Maybe he ran track. He did something else that was demanding neurologically that's similar to boxing. He has to have. He has to have. All great athletes exploit their true potential when they're young. Now, I trained in athletics. I was a football fan. I played a little bit of hockey. I played a little bit of soccer. I wasn't deep into athletics, okay? Believe me, my parents didn't have an extra change. They didn't have extra money to put me in extra curricular activities. So I had an accent. I had to work super hard around the clock to catch up to guys who knew a lot less than me, but they've been training since their youth. 
So when we're wrestling, you could tell that I know more, but these guys are just born fighters. You know, they're, they're, they've been, since they're little kids, they've been wrestling. Since they're little kids, they've been punching and kicking. They have this advantage. And it's amazing because a lot of times guys who learn martial arts when they're young, they make very poor trainers. Very poor. Because they, th they do things in a way they don't even understand. Like if you ask them to show you a move, they're like, I think I would do this. I think I would do that. Like they're just kind of improvising. For them, it's like, Think about when you talk English. Do you know all these grammar rules, guys? If you ask me grammar rules in English, if you ask, I would know very little. I'm very weak in grammar. However, I know how to speak English. Why? I heard it for so many. I heard it for 20 million. I've heard it for millions and millions of hours. I've listened to millions and millions of hours of English. I'm just doing it intuitively because I learned that at such a young age. I learned English. I was listening to English at such a young age. It's the same thing with martial arts. Like sometimes I watch my kids wrestle. And they do moves I've never showed them. And I rewatch the tape and I'm like, what the hell did he just do? How did he do that? I rewatch the tape and it's bizarre. And I wonder to myself, would this work? Like I try it later on, but they're learning in a way that's intuitive. It's far superior for competition. If you look at all the best athletes, they're usually started training young. If you look at all the best instructors, all the best trainers, they usually started late. Why? Because they had to go out there and learn all the grammar rules. They had to go and learn how the engine actually works. So then when you come to them with a problem, they're like, oh, this is what's wrong with your engine. This is what's wrong with your transmission. This is what They understand the, the rules and laws and principles behind the sport. Okay, so that's a very special thing. So number one, start in your youth. Okay, number two, choose your parents wisely. This is an old track and field saying. Choose your parents wisely. And of course you can't choose your parents, but a lot of it is genetic. A lot of it is genetic. You're asking me about Cyril Gann. Look, the guy is 250 plus and he moves like a cat. What made him 250 plus? Genetics. What made him move like a cat? Partly genetics, partly training. Let me explain, okay? Guys, if you noticed his training up to leading up to John Jones, he was doing a lot of stability work. They had him on these two stability balls and they were lifting up his feet. I've said it time and time again. I've talked to you guys about strong and stable knees. The best way to get good. Because you're talking about genetics and then we're talking about coordination. Genetics, coordination. Genetics, coordination. This is key. If you bodybuild, let's say you're doing biceps and then triceps. Then you're doing hamstring curl. Yeah, you'll hypertrophy the muscle. The muscle will get bigger, but the muscle is dumb. It's not coordinated. You're teaching it to bend your arm like this and not move the rest of your body. When are you going to do this in a sport? You need total body movements. We need to develop coordination. We need to develop massive amount of coordination. So for instance, if I ask you to do a cartwheel, can you create momentum? Can you kick your legs up in the air? Can you get upside down, train your proprioceptors? You know, you're discombobulating yourself, you're upside. Do you have the coordination to do a cartwheel? If you're just doing bicep curls your whole life, you won't even have, eventually you won't, you'll never develop the ability to do a cartwheel. Now a cartwheel tells me a lot about your it's funny because when you see John Jones go in the octagon, he does a one arm cartwheel. One arm. The guy's six foot, like he's six foot four, whatever he is. Go do a one arm cartwheel. Try it. It's not easy. It's not easy to do a one arm cartwheel. Okay. They have high levels of coordination. How do you train coordination? Okay. Coordination is two major components. One, you do total body movements. So let's say you do an Olympic lift, that's a total body movement. It's not bicep curl and tricep extension. Tricep extension, you're just training your muscle back and forth. You're doing something that creates, requires such little coordination. When we do our fitness routine, when we go through conditioning, we need to use total body movements. We gotta move away from trying to train just muscle groups, okay? There is, there is some of that, but we wanna train total body movements. When you look at strong and stable program, okay? Every exercise is a total body movement, almost every single one. Why? For this very purpose. And I use a lot of stability ball, a lot. Why? Stability, stability ball training teaches your brain how to control your muscle. It makes you a hyper level of coordination. If you guys ever see me roll, I'm sure you've seen me roll on this channel, you can see my coordination is very high. I move, I twist, I turn, I flip, I, I jump, I roll. This is all very demanding stuff. If you're not efficient at it, you'll gas out, okay? So... Total body movements, stability ball training is a warp speed into... That's why I love it when they were training Cyril Gunn. I was just talking to my students about it today, actually. 
they, I was telling them, you see how even the top athletes, they stumble upon it, even though maybe they don't know that it's making them that good. Their trainer knows. Their trainer understands the importance of stability. They had him on this like two stability balls and then they were lifting his feet up with a strap. I have the same exact exercise in strong and stable back, guys. Make sure to pick up strong and stable back. It's on special level up 50. The promo code is on your screen. Level up 50, get, get it half off, get strong and stable knees. Strong and stable knees is packed with exercises that will challenge your cardio, plyometrics, and high, high level of stability. Okay, I'm not going to get into it now. We talked about it many times. You have to train power, explosiveness, coordination. These guys are highly coordinated. So then when you teach them boxing and kicking and punching and rolling, they're super, super adept. Another thing I really like for coordination is tumbling, like dive rolling, back rolling, uh, cartwheels, like basic gymnastics. You don't have to go and, uh, on the pummel horse, guys. You don't need that. You're a martial artist. You don't need that much. But if you look at wrestlers, when they warm up, and I'm not talking about shrimping along the mat 50,000 times. That's all, like, if it's not challenging, you're wasting your time. Like, I hate those jujitsu warm warmups where 30 minutes of the class is shrimping up and down and doing these little weird crawls. And then, like, like, if I did that with my pros, they would all leave. And then you're doing this little weird extra. It does, if it's not challenging, it's a waste of time. It has to be challenging, okay? I just released uh, um, Turtle Escapes Made Easy, okay? Check it out. The beginning of the video is five progressions. First one is basic Granby roll. Number two is Granby roll from all fours. Number three is Granby roll from four points. Number five, uh, number four is diving shoulder roll. Number five is diving Granby roll. Well, guys, if you can do a diving Granby roll, I tip my hat to you. I guarantee you 99% of grapplers out there, they cannot do a diving Granby roll. How do I How do I know? I make my guys warm up with these progressions and maybe three, four guys can do a diving Granby roll. Even black belts, they can't do a diving, not a diving shoulder roll, a diving Granby roll. So I teach you three progressions to Granby, then one shoulder roll, diving shoulder roll, and then I ask you, I ask you to mix shoulder roll with Granby roll. If you can hit that and somebody's on your back and you dive into a Granby, believe me, he'd have to be elite to stay on your back. Okay, it's a simple maneuver. I love tumbling, tumbling. That's why I start my warm-ups often with tumbling. Mainly Granby roll, not shrimping, because shrimping is pointless. Why? Because that's as good as you're going to get. You could shrimp up and down the, the mat for 10 years. Your shrimp is still the same as the guy who's been doing it for two months. Okay, they did a test once. You know, the ladder training. Okay, so you put a ladder on the floor and people do their footwork drills across the ladder. They measured people after six weeks of training. Then after five years of training, Okay, the amount of progression they made in six years plateaued for the next five. So after doing it for six weeks, it's almost pointless to do it anymore. You're at your max speed. It's shrimping is the kind of same same way. You're not going to shrimp any faster or harder. You're at your maximum once because shrimping is so simple of a technique. If something is not challenging, you're wasting your time. If something is not challenging, you're wasting your time. Now it it also you don't want it to be impossibly hard. It has to be difficult but manageable. People always ask me, how many reps, how many sets? I always tell them, look, if you're building power, it's five reps or less. If you're building endurance, it's 15, 20 reps or more. How many sets, how much weight? It has to be challenging but manageable. That's the key. You have to find the right number. You have to find the right amount of weight. It has to be challenging but manageable. If it's too challenging, you're going to break your back. Okay? You're going to fry your wheels. If it's too easy, you're not going to get much benefit from it. Okay, so you've you got to experiment. Any tra no trainer in the world can know how many reps and sets. They're all just guessing. They kind of give you an evaluation in their mind of how many reps and sets would be challenging without killing you, and they'll give you that reps and sets. But really, they're really guessing. It's better to teach you that tool to learn how to manage your own reps and sets as your training. Guys, with that said, okay, let me recap real quick. One, it's... We said, what was that? We were talking about like making sure you uh, choose your parents wisely. You can't do that. Okay. So your genetics, you're born with them. Okay. Uh, actually, no, sorry. One was learning athletics in your youth. Doesn't necessarily have to be martial arts. If you did track and field in your youth, if you were, I don't know, um, I don't know, hockey player in your youth. Guys, hockey players are fantastic at converting to a martial arts. Why? Because think about it skating. I've trained many hockey players. Okay. I live in Canada. They're doing a plyometric. It's almost like running without the impact. Skating is a phenomenal exercise for the legs. It's so explosive. 
It's very difficult for those of you who have never skated. It's a highly, highly plyometric exercise. It's sprinting on skates. You're sprinting up and down the ice. You're stopping. You're going. It's a crazy cardio workout, and you got to slap the puck sometimes. It's very good for throwing punches. You're doing something dynamic with your upper body. You're working your abs. You're working in explosive fashion. Okay, so start young. Be blessed with genetics. That's something out of our control. Condition the entire body for coordination, tumbling, stability exercise, total body movements, total body movements. Other than that, I will tell you guys, look, find a really good instructor and be a very good student. These are two very important things, okay? You can't really change your genetics, but this is one you can really make a big difference, okay? Find a good gym, be a good student. What's a good student? A good student trains regularly. Avoid injuries like the plague. I'm going to say that again. Avoid injuries like the plague. Once you get injured, it's time out. I don't care how mentally tough you are. I don't care how can, I don't care how motivated you are to make it. If your arm is broken, if your leg is broken, if your ankle is broken, if your neck is broken, you got bigger problems. Your body's saying no, and even though the mind is saying yes, you can't go. Move, you can't move forward. Avoid injuries like the plague. Do stability ball training. It's the best way to avoid injury. I'll tell you why. Okay. Do a workout with the stability ball. You'll notice you'll you won't be sore afterwards. Okay, maybe the first few workouts, if you're new, the noobs, you'll get a little bit sore. But watch after maybe 10 sessions with the stability ball, you're, you're almost never sore. If you work with weights and kettlebell, and I love weights and kettlebell, and I love sprinting, and I love all these other tools. I'm just telling you the stability ball has one very special aspect to it. It doesn't make people sore. So you're strengthening your abs, you're strengthening your legs, you're strengthening your upper body, but... The next day you're not sore. You can do your boxing, your stretch, your your wrestling, your jujitsu. It doesn't impact recovery as much. That's a major, major plus for guys who are training heavily. Okay. Now I will tell you it boosts performance. I will tell you that's one of the number one tools ever. The one thing that made me fall in love with stability ball. Okay, it made me fall in love with it. It, it. To this day, I still work with it. I'll tell you what happened with me. I was doing gymnastics training with George and we're doing muscle ups and I could usually hit like three good muscle ups and it was muscle ups are very tough and I'm talking about on rings, okay, not on a bar. On a bar, it's really easy. And then I had injured my shoulder so I did an SSL program, sports science lab. I did their shoulder recovery program. I did my, my whole body with a stability ball. I learned a lot of stability ball training with the sports science lab. Okay, of course, my stability ball training, I find it to be, I just took the progressions further. They're more difficult, my exercises. Anyways, I hadn't done gymnastics for a month because I had injured my shoulder. I go back on the rings. I hadn't touched the rings in a month. I've been doing stability ball training. I hit seven muscle ups. Me and GSP were freaking out. I, I never did seven muscle ups. Like my max before was three or four. And I did seven easy. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what is it? What, like, and I was realizing I just did a month of stability ball training. But I, had, I, was, I was shocked because I knew that I would, on a good day, I would do three muscle ups in a row. Uh, it shocked me. And I think it had a lot to do with my abs. It really, really took my abs to the next level. So when you're doing muscle up, it's not just shoulders and upper body and back. No, no, no. The abs, the tighter their abs, the less you bleed, the less power is, is bleeding. The more sturdy you are, the easier it is for your upper body to pull you up. So since then, I've been doing stability, stability ball religiously. Like I always knew the importance of stability, stability ball, but that really freaked me out that I was able to hit more than double my normal amount of reps. Um, what else is there to getting really good? Uh, I would say consistency. Don't overtrain. Train enough and hard enough that you can make it the next day. Don't go in on Monday, kill yourself, and then it takes till Thursday for you to go back in the gym. That's the biggest mistake noobs make. They come in, they train too hard, they get hurt, they get injured, they're out for a while, they come back, they seesaw back and forth, and they're in this funk. Forget that. Build. Guys, there's a reason why when you are young, they told you the story about the tortoise versus the hare. Slow and steady wins the race. Somebody was really wise and was like, I'm going to teach this lesson to the next generation of youth. And he made up that story so that the kids could realize the importance of taking one step at a time. It's better to train 70% every day, six days a week, than it is to train 100% on Monday, then 100% on Thursday, and then 100% on Saturday. And you, you need those long breaks in between. Believe me, the guy who's training daily, he's going to pass you quick. It's all about punching in, getting in a good workout, coming back the next day. Don't kill yourself so badly that you need a month to recover. Okay, guys, I hope that answered the first question very thoroughly. I'm going to be opening up to the 
questions in the chat room real quick, but I just want to go over the questions I gave out in um, the post yesterday. Coach, if I could only do one exercise, what would it be and why? All the best, Coach. That's from Johnny Utah. That was question number two, the second most popular question. Guys, look up on the top of your screen. Look at that. Strong and stable running. Running is the best exercise. Sprinting. Sprinting. Why? For a combat athlete, what I recommend to you, listen to what I recommend, 20-meter sprints or 30-meter sprints or even 10-meter sprints. They're all good. Shuttle sprinting. Sprint back and forth for two minutes. One-minute break. I like to shuttle box. I take one-minute break, shuttle box. Then I sprint again, two minutes back and forth. Okay. Now, this style of conditioning is very popular in soccer. Look at Jose Aldo. In rugby, look at uh, Volkanovski. Rugby players, they do a lot of, uh, back in the day, it was mandatory to do beep tests. Now they, they kind of change that. Beep test is a 20-meter sprint. There's a beep. It, the beep increases. You got to make it to the other side before the next beep. If you're not on the other side before the next beep, they flag you once. Second time, you're out. Okay, so they, they measure your ability to produce explosive power using the beep test. I use the beep test once in a while, but it's not a necessary metric, okay? What's important is that you sprint, now, why 20 meters? I love 20 meters because that builds muscle, okay? If you run too long, it chews up muscle. It's catabolic. If you run 5K on a regular basis, you might start losing muscle. You might start lowering your testosterone. That's no bueno, okay? We don't want to lower testosterone. We want to do the opposite. We want to pack on muscle and we want to spike our testosterone. The number one exercise for spiking your testosterone, by the way, guys, is sprinting. Not running, not long distance running, sprinting. When you sprint in short distances and you stop and go, you stop and go, you're working your muscles in your legs. Your legs have to stop, start again, stop. There's no momentum to carry you. The muscles are working over time. Now, I really recommend you start gently. You can become very, very sore if you've never done this before. Okay, watch. You sprint 20 meters back and forth for two minutes, but you're going about 50, 60%. You shot a box for one minute. You do that for, let's say, five rounds. That's a whole workout. That's a crazy workout. You're building that cardio. You're building your muscle in your legs. You're spiking your testosterone. How often would you want to do that? Once to twice a week max. Okay, and strong and stable guys, I give you a full program. Full program. Running programs are super simple, but how to incorporate them in your jiu-jitsu and your combat training, it's all in there. I talk about 30-meter sprints, why it's my favorite, all that. It's really, really important. To not run long distance too often. I run long distance once in a blue moon. I almost never use it. I almost never use it. It's not that important, okay? Because when you're shuttle sprinting, let's say something, I'll give you another workout, okay? A 15 minute, let's say you're an MMA fighter, 15 minute workout. Shuttles for one minute, shadow boxing for one minute. Shuttles for one minute, shadow, I do that for 15 minutes. As you go in the later minutes, it starts to become aerobic naturally. So you're constantly working anaerobic training, anaerobic training. You're constantly getting both, but in an aerobic and an anaerobic fashion, you're giving us bursts of energy. That's what we want. That's what fighting is, bursts of energy, bursts of energy. Sprinting, in my opinion, is the number one uh, exercise for combat athletes and for one major reason. I like it much better than airdyne. Like a lot of people like assault bike. The problem with assault bike is ground force reaction. You're not exploding off the ground. The contact between your foot and the ground is a plyometric. It's very explosive. In a airdyne or assault bike, it's gradual. Now, do you need power gradually in a fight or do you want to go from zero to 60 in a fraction of a second? That's my question to you. Obviously, you want to be explosive. You need ground force, ground force reaction. You need to train that foot contact bouncing off the ground. It's going to train your the muscles in your feet. Okay, it's going to train your muscles in your feet more explosively than a uh, airdyne or assault bike. Assault bike is good because it's low impact. It's very good for hitting the cardio, building lactic acid. It has its place. I believe, guys, for just for you guys to know, I believe in using all exercises. Okay, I use kettlebell. I use deadlift. I use stretch bands. I use sprints. I use the row machine. I use the assault bike. I do hurdles. I do. I think everything is good. What gives you the most bang for your buck? If you had only one tool, if you're training economy, you don't have plenty, you don't have a full-time trainer, you don't have a full-time gym, you're just doing this kind of like as a, a spare time athlete, I will tell you kettlebell. Kettlebell hits the most birds with one stone. It could build you strength. It could build your power. It could build you. It's a low impact plyometric. 
You could do, you could build crazy endurance with kettlebell, crazy endurance in a 15 minute workout or 10 minute workout. I could burn you out with kettlebell. Try to do alternating snatches for 15 minutes nonstop. You're gonna be dead after. Yeah, there's actually a nice video of Volkanovski doing it. Alternating snatch, one right, snatch right, snatch left, snatch right. Just 15 minutes flat. Just do that as many times as you can. Guess what? You're gonna be in crazy shape. Kettlebell is simple. The techniques are not simple. You, you really gotta know the technique. Okay, check out uh, strong and stable kettlebell. It's really the technique is there. And then the workouts are simple, efficient, and it trains also your grip. That's what I love about kettlebell. It also trains your grip. Now, you also need deadlifting. I really believe deadlifting is super important to keep a strong and healthy back. Kettlebell is great, but deadlift has its place. Why? Because you'll never lift that much weight with a kettlebell, right? Kettlebells, you can't, you, you won't find a 300 pound kettlebell. You need to pack on the weight on the bar, and once a month, once every two months, you need to hit your deadlifts. I always recommend to be able to deadlift 1.2 to 1.5 times your body weight. It might not seem like a lot, but I feel that going beyond that is just counterproductive. It takes too much neurological recharge, recovery. It kills your jujitsu. Your back's going to be tight. If you're trying to build it, double your weight in deadlift, you're going to strain your back. You're going to have to miss a lot of days of combat training. The, the world's best combat athletes, they don't squat double their weight. There are very few. And the ones that do, guys, I'll tell you something, a lot of them are on substances. Okay, so let's be realistic. If you're not on substances, after 1.5 times your body weight, it's plenty. You have plenty of reserve. You don't need to go to double. Now, it's not impossible to get to double. You can manage it. It's just like, it's a lot of pain for nothing. I don't think it'll really improve you. Okay, guys, with that said... Um, let's open it up to the questions in the chat room because I see there's a lot of super chats. What do you think about Henry Atkins' hidden jiu-jitsu? That's from Varun. Varun, I'm not familiar with his style, but I know he's a black belt under Hickson. Once upon a time, we we're supposed to work together, do a seminar, but we didn't do it. And I can't remember why, but um, he's uh, a black belt under Hickson. And Hickson has that hidden style. Like, I worked with Hodger for a few years, so he has that hidden style. That's why I coined the term advanced basics. It's t I totally think it's great. You're basically learning armbar, but with more details, things that most people don't see, nuances. I love it. That's why I, I named my basic series, called I called it advanced basics, because it's basic moves, but they're done with these key details. I never got to work with him, so I've never seen his material, but it's a very powerful uh, way of training, doing armbar, but in depth. <clears throat> What else we got here? You mentioned your kids wrestle. What's the best class you sell that would be good to help my cousin athleticism and exercise ball? Thanks in advance. Luis Ver Veranos. Guys, I think Strong and Stable Knees is the most advanced training program in the world. Um, do the exercises in there. They're phenomenal. Get Strong and Stable back. Those two together. And you're, if your child is very young, I would put him in gymnastics. Okay, If he's very young, put him in gymnastics. Um, if you're an adult, gymnastics is very hard to do. Okay, it's it's almost unattainable because you have to start that stuff when you're really young. You you've never seen a gymnast get to the Olympics, and he was uh, starting in the age of twenty. It never it's never gonna happen. You'll never see a guy start at the age of twenty or or eighteen, nineteen, and then do gymnastics all the way to the Olympics. This is a sport that has to be done in in their youth. Okay, um, if if you're adults, use a strong and stable program. But if let's say a young kid, I would get him into gymnastics. Gymnastics or even better maybe track and field. If you don't have gymnastics, go for track and field. If you don't have track and field, try to find a gymnastics practice for him. What would you recommend a combat sambist to change to MMA? And do you think combat sambo world champions were, would all do good in MMA or are Khabib and Islam outliers? That's from... Tyler Weber. Tyler, I got to tell you something. I don't see the difference between combat. I don't see the difference between sambo and jiu-jitsu, really. We all use the same techniques. I would tell you jiu-jitsu is far more advanced. The, the one bad thing about jiu-jitsu is most jiu-jitsu schools don't wrestle. And that's quickly changed, okay? The top schools, we all wrestle now. We all involve wrestling. I make my guys wrestle every single day. Like, we warm up on the ground, and then once we break a sweat, we start wrestling standing. Not everybody does it. We separate, you know, the guys who are going to wrestle, we go in this room, they're... But it's available every day. We have guys in the gym wrestling, standing every day. That's It's gone. Those days of just jiu-jitsu schools, just being on the ground, is quickly dying. It's quickly, quickly dying. 
the one thing Sambo had an advantage on in jiu-jitsu was their stand-up, okay? That's going to be gone. In the next 5, 10 years, we won't be talking about that no more. Jiu-jitsu schools are wisening up. The other thing is, their jiu-jitsu on the ground is not as good, but in MMA, it doesn't matter as much because you're hitting each other. So you'd fight a jiu-jitsu guy versus a Sambo guy. The Sambo guy would get on top, and just even though the jiu-jitsu guy might be better on the ground, it doesn't matter because he's punching him. In the future, you're going to see jiu-jitsu guys win all the time because the jiu-jitsu is far more sophisticated. It's more sophisticated, guys. I got to tell you. Like, I love Sambo practitioners. I've trained with guys here and there. I know some of them are great, but by and large, if you did a world, if you did a competition, a grappling competition, Sambo versus Jiu-Jitsu, you took the 10 best Sambo guys against the 10 best Jiu-Jitsu guys, I'm telling you, 9 out of 10 Jiu-Jitsu guys are going to win. Now, in MMA, it's going to be different. It's probably going to be more 50-50, depending on the guy's ability to strike and wrestle. But the, you know the Sambo guys are wrestling. This was a huge error on the part of Jiu-Jitsu to throw out the wrestling, to put wrestling on the on the back shelf, standing wrestling. You need both. You need wrestling and jiu-jitsu. Guys, I can't stand. I ha- I don't like the style of jiu-jitsu where you flop to your butt. I hate it. I find it disgusting. I find it horrible. Why can't you teach this guy to wrestle? You can. It's learnable. It's just as attainable as jiu-jitsu. Learning to wrestle is not any harder than jiu-jitsu. If you, learning, if you learn jiu-jitsu, you can learn to wrestle. It's just how, how, to, how to go about it. The techniques are just as technical. You warm up on the ground. I like to warm up two rounds grappling on the floor. I do a free roll. And then once I'm sweaty, I wrestle. I never wrestle bone dry. I never do technique and start wrestling standing. No, I'm going to get injured. You know, it's going to strain. I get really, really warmed up. And then I go live standing. I think it's the, that's when I used to wrestle with the Olympic team, the freestyle Olympic wrestling team. That's how we did it. We warmed up parterre, which means on the ground. We warmed up technique on the ground and then wrestle standing. <clears throat> I'm a four stripe blue belt BJJ for six years I have won worlds at Ross, R- Rooster but I always get smashed from bigger opponents any advice that's from Iam Guilherberto yeah I would tell you master guard retention if you're a smaller guy you could not make an error in this in this uh, part of the fight. Like, for instance, I trained with George a lot. He's a killer passer. Okay, that's why for so many years, I, I put so much attention on guard retention, guard retention. Guard. Because if he passed my guard, it was hell. I was crushed underneath him. It's hell. Become a guard retention master. If you want to be able to fight bigger guys, why do we call it the guard? When you're on your back, why do we call it the guard? Because your legs are guarding you. Once the guy passes your legs, you have no more guard. You cannot guard yourself. Think about why they call it the guard. Jiu-jitsu is really the art of using your legs and hips. The upper body is the assistance. The upper body is assisting the legs and hips. The legs and hips are the star of the show. Okay? Another thing I would tell you is learn your leg entanglements. Learn your ashigramis. Most big guys don't know leg entanglements. That's the one way I can kind of take you in a maze. Strength doesn't really matter as much here because it's it's complicated. If you make a mistake, I take your knee, I take your heel, I take your back. It's a comp, it's a thinking man's game. If you didn't study this terrain, you're gonna get lost, you're gonna get drowned here. That's why I like Ashigrami, because there's a lot of details. So now it's more cerebral than it is physical. But if I would, if I could tell you one thing, become a master of guard retention. Like guys, I every day when I roll, I either start passing the guard when I warm up, it's pass the guard or guard. I can't stand when somebody passes my guard. I, I have nightmares about it. If somebody passes my guard, that means they could crush me. They could, they could, if they, I always assume they're bigger and stronger. Never let somebody pass your guard. Like, make it a strong focal point. Now, a lot of people talk about escaping side control, escaping the back. That's all very good. And back and side control escape are very important. But not at the expense of guard. You have to master guard retention, master guard retention, and do some back escape, side control escape, mount escape, 80% guard retention, 20% escapes of position, positional and submission escapes. Why? Why only 20%? Because you don't want to get good at working with low amounts of leverage. If I escape the back, it's usually because I have more experience than you. I know all the details of back escape. I, I've got good in that back. I, like, I've had people start on my back and I've practiced escaping the back. It's a very powerful tool, sure. But not at the expense of you passing my guard. Because imagine we're fighting, okay? Imagine we're fighting. You pass my guard. You take my back. I escape. Guess what? You won. I lost. 
Time runs out. You won. I lost. If you're trying to pass my guard and you can't pass my guard, it's 0-0. Zero, zero. It's great to escape side control. It's, it's great to escape the back. It's great to escape mount. But guess what? You just gave this guy points and positional dominance. If you're in an MMA, MMA fight and you escape mount, the judges are going to be like, well, you know what? You escape mount, but the guy still mounted you. He still got advantage on you. He wins. So what I'm trying to tell you is escaping is essential, but we train it 20% of the time. Why? Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine somebody was training a defensive style of jiu-jitsu. And I've had guys walk in the gym, man. They're so good in defense. It's crazy. Their whole game, is they're like 90% of the match, they're defending, defending. They're defending with the turtle, then defending guard, then they're turning to their stomach, and they're rolling out. It's incredible. It's really amazing. But guess what? They lost. Guess what? Look at the scoreboard. It's 10-0, 8-0, 4-0. Defense is great, but it doesn't necessarily win the fight. Okay, I love defense. Not wrong. Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine fighter A is spending 80% of his time on positional escape and only 20% of his time on guard retention. And then we have fighter B. Fighter B is doing guard retention, 80%, and 20% side control escape, mount escape, leg lock escape, armbar escape. He's doing positional and submission escape. The two fight. Guess what? Fighter B passes his guard. He scores. Fighter A escapes. Fighter B is winning. And Fighter B takes the back. Fighter A escapes. Fighter B is winning, guys. How do you put points up on the board? You need to be impassable and you need to have an irresistible attack. You got to cycle back into an offensive attack. Um, I think defense is great. As you get into higher belts, you should really focus on defense, but not at the expense of teaching your, your students to first have a perfect guard and perfect guard passing. Guard and guard passing is the most important crucial element for ground fighting. Chicken is so fake these days, I'd rather eat bed, bread. <laughs> That's from Hassan Khan, who wanted to share that with us. Thank you for those insights, Hassan. John Cleary, I'm 40 years old, can't get my toes to the mat behind my head when stacked and inverted. Okay, so you can't do a Granby roll, basically. How can I develop this type of flexibility? You're the man, coach. That's from John Cleary. John, this is what I would tell you. Get a stability ball. Get a 75 centimeter. Get the biggest one, okay? Lay your back on it. Lay your back on it, like back bridge. Okay, back bridge. Do the opposite of what you're looking for. Do the back bridge, okay? So back bridge, you're rolling your back on the mat. You're touching your hands on the mat. Hang out there. Lift one leg up. Hang out. Don't worry about reps, sets, and time. Uh, reps, not. Just do it as, just get comfortable. So you, you're you learning, you want to get in a Granby roll. I'm telling you, do the complete opposite. Stretch your back that way, okay? Be gentle, of course, always. Get a big stability ball so the, the arc is not so aggressive. And then slowly, lie down on your back. Grab the stability ball with your feet. Throw your legs up over your feet and get upside down in that position. Because you have the ball, you won't have to go as far. And as you rep it out back and forth, you're doing both motions. Okay, So you're bending your back this way, then you're bending your back that way, and you're slowly teaching your spine that it's not dangerous to flex forward and backwards, flex forward and backwards, flex forward and backwards, and use the ball between your feet to throw it up behind you. Now the ball will, will reach the ground because it's basically a crutch now. It's acting as a crutch. And then you can slowly use a smaller ball, smaller ball, and eventually no ball, and you get your feet to touch the ground. This is a very important motion because if you don't, if you cannot do this uh, motion, you will never be able to retain guard. You'll always get guard passed. If you cannot bring your legs up behind your head, you will eventually get guard passed. The closer you can bring your head, your leg behind your head, the easier it is for you to regard. Okay. So I don't know if you guys have seen George's style of guard. He's very arm drag invert heavy why he doesn't have that really strong flexibility where he's not the type of guy where his leg will go behind his head he's more of the type of guy who's he could do a, almost a, a full split but not leg behind the head like you see i have a good flexibility like that like if you look at bj penny he, he could throw his leg behind his head all those guys with that crazy dis dexterity they're always extremely hard to pass even if they're blue belts the guy's a blue belt but he has that type of dexterity it's almost impossible to pass his guard okay if you look at the strong and stable knees i have a stretch in that video that's called the jiu-jitsu stretch i tell all jiu-jitsu practitioners you have to get good at this stretch you basically put yourself in a pigeon you know you bend your leg on the ball and you're pushing that leg into the ball 
You're not just stretching. I don't like passive stretching. I hate guys. I never stretch. I need my leg not to flex in that position, but to f to contract in that position. I don't want my leg behind my head and it's floppy. No, no. I want to put it behind my head and I want it to be strong there. I want it to be flexing. I want it to have power in that position. Plus, it's a super important movement to protecting your knees. So I have my leg on the ball and I'm pushing into the ball. I'm pushing into the ball. My leg is flexing. And then I relax and I stretch. And then I flex, relax and stretch. It's called PNF, okay? You're flexing, you're stretching. You're, that's another very good exercise, by the way. Guys, use level up, 50 off. The promo code is on the screen. And get 50% off on anything on Juju Club, okay? That's a very good exercise to learn how to put your head, your leg behind your head, okay? But you need to back bend both ways, okay? You need to back bend both ways. You need to bend one way and then bend the other. Okay, but don't be aggressive with backbending. Be gentle and progress slowly. Salam, coach. Can you give advice on how to overcome fear of failure and how to keep one's pride as a man after losing, whether sparring or self-defense? That's from someone. Guys, let me tell you guys a little secret. We all eat humble pie. Every one of us, every even Mayweather. Oh, Khabib's never lost a fight, guys. Let me tell you something about Khabib. I'm sure he would admit to this. Growing up, he got his ass kicked countless times. Countless times. But he never gave up. He kept, he kept going. That's the attitude you have to adopt. Humble pie tastes horrible. It's, it sucks. There's nothing worse, however... You got to put on your bib and dig in. Get your spoon. Get your spoon and dig in. Guess what? You'll never do anything good in life unless you're ready to eat humble pie. I hate to say it. Nobody hates eating humble pie more than me. I eat it all the time. It's good for you. It's got vitamins. But I hate the taste. George St. Pierre got his ass kicked a gazillion times before he got, got, became world champion. He ate humble pie countless times. I'm talking about growing up as a karate practitioner, combat, he did amateur sports. These guys take beating after beating and then they become good. And then you're like, you just saw him in his prime. You never, you didn't know his past. You think he's so good all these years. No, 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 no. The guy used to be horrible. We all start white belt. I never seen a guy walk in on the first day and somebody hand him a black belt. Never, never going to happen. It's never happened. I've seen guys with good potential, but they still get their butt kicked. Get used to eating humble pie. Don't cry too much about it. Suck it up. I know it sucks. I know it tastes bitter. But I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It has vitamins. When you see somebody else eat humble pie, don't make fun of him. That just means, if, you make, if you're the type of guy who makes fun of another man eating humble pie, that means you're the type of guy who doesn't have the guts. That means you don't have the guts to try. If you never ate humble pie, it's because people handed you down a life. You know, maybe you're some... Maybe you're you inherited millions of dollars and you have a butler and you never you never ate humble pie. Well, guess what? You also inherited everything. You never made nothing. You didn't contribute to society. You're just there. You're just there inheriting what somebody else did. Somebody else's success. And like it or not, that's gonna eat at you a, a bit as a man. It's gonna be, you know, if you're if you're born rich, I don't blame you at all. Like I hope my kids in the future they inherit massive amounts of money, but as long as you're still out there contributing, developing yourself as a human being. We'll talk about that maybe later, okay? Because self-development is important for finding happiness. We'll talk about psychology later on, Abraham Maslow. If you don't develop as a human being, you will find misery. So rich people can't be miserable if they're not always improving as human beings. Improving, growing, exploiting their potential. They will find uh, levels of misery, sadness, uh, depression etc even though they're rich even though they have a butler even though they have a rose rust in the in the driveway it won't matter okay nothing is better than working your way eating a little humble pie and then making it oh what a feeling man what a feeling making it getting through it all getting to the other side i ate humble pie now i really man now i really i savor whatever i got okay if it cost a lot of time energy and difficulty Look, when I was when I was an amateur fighter, I competed a lot as a Muay Thai fighter and Jiu Jitsu, and I had a bunch of medals and trophies. And we had a flood in my basement, 
And my wife asked me, what do you want me to do with, to do with this stuff? I told her, anything that touched water, throw it out. Some of my trophies she threw out. I was freaking out. I got home. I'm like, what, are you, what, what happened? I seemed like some trophies that were in the garbage. They're gone. They're finished. You told me if it touched water, throw it out. I'm like, not my, not my trophies. Not my trophies. I had to beat a man to death to get this. Like, like all the weight cutting. And you know, I was an amateur fighter. It's not like I was pro or anything, but still, it means a lot to me. It's not like something like it's not, they're not worth anything. They're not worth a penny. What I'm saying is like I put so much time and energy, and for me, martial arts and training was very, very important. It still is, obviously. It meant a lot to me personally, but to her, to her, it's just a piece of plastic and it's just a shiny little garbage. You know, and like for me, it's like people don't understand when you pay a dear price for something. Oh, it's a, it's a satisfactory feeling to to achieve your goal. So think about it like that. You're eating humble pie now. If I don't quit, I'll eventually get to the other side. If you don't quit, you will eventually find your way to the other side. And there's no greater feeling than getting on the other side. All right, here, a bunch of super chats. Guys, slow it down, please. Assalamu alaikum, coach. This is from Deaf Guy 319. Assalamu alaikum, coach. You mentioned your wife healed her rheumatoid arthritis. I have RA as well, and it's screwing up my BJJ training. I'm too stiff. Can I ask what your wife did to cure her autoimmune condition? Guys, this is a very serious question. Let me tell you something. When my wife went to the doctor, okay, they gave her a drug that cost over $1,000 a month for her rheumatoid arthritis. It had all sorts of negative side effects. I did research. I was. I told her, you know what? No, we're gonna we're gonna do it, Jason Fung's way. We're gonna. I combine um, uh, uh, Joel Furman with Jason Fung's. I'm gonna get into the details about it in just a sec. And she got off the medications completely. Now she went to the doctor. The doctor looked at her. She's like, okay, your arthritis is it's it's in remission. You're perfect. You're fine. And they were because they had changed drug at one point because she was having negative side effects and they juggled it around and then she's like okay where are we at now she's like i'm not on any drug whatsoever and the doctor was shocked now listen to this the doctor told her what how did you what do you mean you're not on the drug she's i stopped taking it my husband told me to stop my husband encouraged me to stop and i stopped taking i haven't taken it in months and the doctor was like how did you do it she said diet the doctor said this is what the doctor said she said I've heard about it, but you're the first per person in my 30 years of practice that ever did it via diet. Manage your rheumatoid arthritis via diet. Now, when my wife was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, I went in a deep dive in research. Even my wife didn't do any. I'm telling you, my wife, she, God bless her. She's a sweet woman, but she trusts these doctors. She goes in there and she's like, whatever the doctor says, I'm going to do. Okay. I went in a deep dive. I started reading books on rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, Dr. Furman and uh, Jason Fung especially, okay? And I was reading research. I was reading blogs of people who had it, what they did, and people out there got over it via using only diet. Jason Fung says you can do it via diet. Firm, Dr. Furman says you can do it via diet. Guess what? My wife did it via diet. Look up um, the end of dieting. Look up the works of Jason Fung on intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is fantastic for... Um, there's also, you're going to eliminate certain food groups. Uh, rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis can be cured via food as per Jason Fung, Dr. Jason Fung and Dr. Jo Joel Furman. Not me, guys. I'm nothing. I'm, I don't give a medical advice. I'm telling you, in their books, they talk about it and they've cured their patients adjusting their diets. The doctor had told my wife, it's the first time in her entire career she ever seen anybody get off medication cure their rheumatoid arthritis without the use of drugs it's very possible and of course guys exercise regular exercise is very important for rheumatoid arthritis ra it is very very curable i highly highly recommend intermittent fasting and what joel Furman calls nutritarianism okay nutritarianism get the book the end of dieting very very good read salam coach this is from ozzy Salam, coach. When I was younger, I had an orange belt in judo. I want to get back into MMA now that I'm 18, but I have no clue which art to practice. Any suggestions where to begin? I would say you would start with basic jujitsu. 
Okay, start with basic jiu-jitsu. Get back into your kickboxing routine. You said you do taekwondo. Try to add kickboxing to it. And oh, uh, sorry, you said judo. Pardon me. Okay, judo is great. It's a great base. Get into jiu-jitsu. Slowly work your way into adding a striking program. Get the best of best of both worlds, and just get into it slowly. You know how much time do you have to dedicate? That's also an important factor. You know you didn't mention that. It's hard for me to tell you, but I would say start with the basics. Start with jujitsu. Find a good basics program. Start with armbar, triangle, omoplata. Don't do anything fancy. Start with basic passing. Start with the basics. There's no need to learn complicated things that you're not going to use. Okay, start with the basics. The basics, guys, as defined by John Denner, are techniques that you use from white belt to black belt. Basics doesn't mean, oh, it only works at a weak level. That's not what basics mean. It's a very a massive misconception by most people. People think, oh, something is basic. That means you can only beat beginners. No, 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 no. Basics, we categorize basics as moves you use from white belt all the way to black belt, meaning that they're fundamental. That's what really this should be called, fundamental maneuvers, okay? Basics means they're there in every recipe. They're, it's the base of all fighting. You can't do without it. Okay, if you're a great wrestler but you don't know armbar, somebody's gonna armbar you. You take a guy down, you get an armbar. You have to know these techniques. You can't get away. Jiu-jitsu mixed with any other art could be better than jiu-jitsu, but arts, pure arts, jiu-jitsu wins. If you're a wrestler, you need to know jiu-jitsu. If you're a boxer, you need to know jiu-jitsu. However, you can win fights with just jiu-jitsu. You could be a jiu-jitsu guy who never learned boxing, never learned wrestling, and figure out how to get a guy to the ground, just bring him down to the ground and choke him. Jiu-jitsu is, jiu-jitsu is the base. It's a really important base. Um, Tom Green, what kind of stance do you recommend for someone skinny who likes to kick and look for takedowns? I'm always experimenting, but not sure what to stick to, what to stick with. Thanks. Tom, I really recommend using Thai boxing, karate stance, and boxing stance. Mix the three up. Learn all three, and as you're fighting, kind of play between the three until you find what you're comfortable with, okay? It's not true that Muay Thai stance always works. It's not true that boxing stance always works. And it's definitely not true that karate stance always works. I like to shift. Sometimes I'm sparring. I shift from one to the other. I learn all three arts. But then again, that's a tall order. That's a lot of, to remember. Guys, don't forget, I'm also a karate black belt. Okay? I've been doing Muay Thai forever and boxing forever as well. I'm a karate black belt as well. Side kick, back kick, scissor kicks. Like These are all fantastic maneuvers. But they take time and energy to learn. If I had to pick one of the arts, I'd probably be pick boxing for, for self-defense i would pick boxing <clears throat> guys you know what i i would pick boxing or muay thai for me they're interchangeable i wouldn't pick karate for self-defense if i had the choice between muay thai and, karate, and boxing i'll tell you why because karate needs a lot of space if you get into a fight you're not going to start sticking and moving sticking and moving for 20 minutes no you're fighting let's say you're in a parking lot let's say you're in a restaurant you're getting into a fight let's say you're getting into a fight and i don't know you're in a classroom or whatever you may be you're, def- you're in a self-defense situation maybe you're at the airport there's people all around you you're in chairs around you whatever you, you know what? you can't just it's a it's a distance thing karate need, requires a lot of distance you might not have that muay thai you could it works in distance not with distance and it's very very defensive it's hard to hurt a good muay thai guy it's very difficult to hurt a good Muay Thai guy. Okay, what else we got here? This is from KD Japo. What advice would you give new fathers? Ooh, that's a good one. Guys, this is a good question. Fathering these days is not so easy. Why? Depends what your goals are. Listen, I believe my children, my goal for my children is to make them successful their whole childhood is about me making them successful in the future not about giving them the most happiness that's that's a fool's that's a fool's objective now don't get me wrong i want my kids to have a happy childhood but what does it do to have such a happy childhood and then it's have such a miserable adulthood what does it do then you're living in the past all the time i used to be happy now it's torture i have to live in this world where nobody showers me with love and candies and tells me i'm so great what would you rather be would you rather be a child Let's do, again, a thought experiment. A child who grew up being showered with love and gifts and spoils and hugs and kisses, and then you go out in the world and you realize the world, you're not the world's baby. People are asking you to carry your own weight. People are asking you to wipe your own nose. People are asking you to produce some kind of product or service. People are asking you to hustle. Your your boss doesn't care you have a little bit of a tummy ache. If you don't show up to work, you're fired. 
Why would you take your child from hot water to cold water? My, our job as parents is to prepare our child not to survive in adulthood, but to thrive. To thrive. My kid's childhood, I tell my sons, I tell them straight up. Guys, my job is not to make your life super easy. My job is to make your adulthood easy, not your childhood. Childhood is preparation for adulthood. I'm teaching you to work hard and think. Those are the two most important things. Work hard and think. That's why I love jujitsu. Jiu-jitsu is hard work and it's chess. You're playing chess. You're figuring out, why do I put my hand here? Why am I going to the guy's back? What's vulnerable? What's dangerous here? What situation am I in? How do I think? How do I think? And I'm like a dog on a bone, man. I got cardio. I got strength. If you put me in position, you know, when somebody's on top of you, it's suffocating you. I don't panic. Under pressure, I don't panic. Guys, there's so many good jiu-jitsu guys. They do badly in life. You know what I tell them? I, I, it freaks me out. I'm like, man, don't you understand? You have the tools to survive and thrive in life. You're just not using them. You're not, you're not taking what you learned in martial arts and adding it to life. It's like they turn off some, and then you have another breed of martial artist. They use everything they learned in martial arts in life. And a great example of that is Roshan Pierre. I'll tell you, it's incredible. So many times we go out for dinner, he wants to talk about something or he has a situation and we sit there and he's a very strategic man. And he's like, and you could see he's using all the principles he learned about martial arts, all the all the stuff I'm telling you. When they push, you pull. You know, he has a great documentary, a DNA of JSP. You see him talking about it. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. Not an educated person, guys. He didn't go, okay, he, he did high school. He didn't go to university. He didn't get a diploma. But I'll tell you something. He's got more brains than most guys with diplomas I've met. He's, he's got a PhD in martial arts. This man has a PhD in martial And he thinks about life as, he even tells you, oh, I see life as a fight, as a mathematical problem. I try to reason my way. Like he's very, very in tuned with assessing a problem and finding a, an intelligent manner to prob he's a problem solver, okay? That's why I like wrestling for kids, jiu-jitsu for kids. It's going to build their character. They learned that they used to suck and now that they're good and how they got there, they climbed that ladder. Guys who never, the guys who never climbed a ladder, I'm going to say something really important here because this is very important in childhood. You have to have climbed a ladder. Let's say, for instance, I'm in a room with a doctor. Let's say he's a doctor. He's got a PhD in medicine. I know nothing about medicine. I know very, very little. Okay. If he gives me his opinion, I respect his opinion. I don't think my opinion is equal to his. I don't take his opinion blindly. I'll ask another doctor. I'll do due diligence. Like I'll ask four or five doctors. But I respect his opinion. Why? I realize that for him to get a PhD, he had to be somebody very hardworking and special. Now, if I meet an engineer, that engineer, I'm thinking to myself, hey, this guy knows a lot about buildings and structures, etc., I know that they didn't, just, they didn't just give this guy his credentials because he was really nice. No, no, this guy has information and he's passed tests and he's proven to, have to be competent in this field. Now, when people reach mastery in one domain, they respect other people's mastery in different domains. They have this humble attitude. They realize, hey, for you to got where you where you got, you must have went so far. Now, when you meet sometimes People who never did that. Not all people, but some people have this dismissive attitude. Oh, these so-called experts. Oh, yeah, whatever. The doctor said this. What does he know? They seem to dismiss everybody. Why? Because they never really reached that level. And maybe they have a mundane job or maybe they have something that's very, you know, regular. They have a regular. And they try to look down on experts. Why? Because they never, they don't understand what it takes. They never went through those steps. So they have a, this type of ignorance. Not all people, guys. I don't. Want, I'm not. I don't want to generalize. But I've met people like this. Like they kind of generalize. You know, like I'll. I'll tell you what. Where I'm coming from here. So many times I was in a public setting and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and say, "Hey, why didn't this fighter do that? Why didn't that fighter do this? I would have done this. I would have done that." And they're looking down on the guy. One time I had a really, really bad experience with somebody. He tapped me on the shoulder. One of my fighters had lost a really big fight, and he was like telling me, "You know, he should have done this." And the guy was just all over me. And he was this expert. And he was like chewing my ear off. And I was like, well, you know, it's not that easy. It's easier said than done. The other guy was really good too. Yes, we made mistakes. We're back on the drawing board. But, you know, it's, you know, it was a difficult fight. And he's like talking down 
to both of us, like, we don't know what we're doing. So I invited him to the gym. I said, okay, you know what? Come in on Monday. Let's glove up. I guess I've done this countless times. He never showed up. Why? He real he sobered up. He realized, hey, wait a second. Armchair quarterbacking, really easy. Get in with these guys? Whew. Guys, I wouldn't have heard him, but I would have made him understand. And I've done this in the past, guys. I've had so many people give me theories. I always ask them, okay, come in the gym, show me. If you can do it, I'm a believer. But I need to see it. They cha- they they sober up. When there's no test, everybody talks. They yap, 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 yap. Once you test them, oh, no, 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 we, we're not confident anymore. In their heart of hearts, they know it's untested. When you meet an expert, a true expert, they've been tested. They've been tested. You have to respect that. Your children have to be tested, not tested, not tort. Don't, don't go out there and start, you know, crushing your kids. But they have to be educated, hardworking, good moral character. This is also very important. They will not have a happy, satisfying life if they have poor moral character. This is, I'm telling you, crucial. Then they're going to have a beautiful byproduct. The byproduct is going to be called confidence. They're going to be confident people. They're going to go out in the world and say, hey, I don't need this woman in my life. I could just, she doesn't behave, she's not good with me. I'll divorce her. I'll get rid of her. I don't need to work for this guy. I can go start my own business. The guy has his own wings. The guy's independent or the woman is independent. You want to create strong, capable, independent, competent in the, uh, children, adults, young adults, that have this confidence. They don't need to rely on other people. Yes, they cooperate with other people, but they're not at the mercy of other people. This is very important. The more you're at the mercy of other people, the more that's going to affect your satisfaction and happiness in life. The more you depend on others, not th- I'm not talking about sy- synergy or cooperation. I love co- I'm all for cooperation and synergy. But when... I have to put my hand out and kind of beg people to give me what I need. That's cute when you're a kid. It's not cute when you're an adult. So my advice to you, maybe I went a little bit too far on this. This is a very important topic, I find. Teach your kids to thrive, educated, strong, intelligent, capable. So when they go out in the world, they can meet other capable people and have a healthy relationship. It's very important that when you have a relationship with other people, you're interdependent. You're not dependent on one another. You're interdependent. You're not independent. Like, I'm not independent from my wife, but I'm not. De- I'm definitely not dependent. Okay? No, no Arab man will ever be dependent on his woman. If you understand our culture, okay? It's not, it's not how we operate. Uh, my Arab uh, audience out there understands exactly what I'm saying. But we want to be interdependent, guys. Let's be honest. We want to be interdependent. I don't want my wife to be dependent on me. I want her to be interdependent. If she was dependent on me, that means she's here. Maybe she's not here because she wants to be. No, no, no. I don't want no wife that doesn't want to be here. No, she has to be interdependent. What does that mean, interdependent? We could operate independently, but we choose to operate together. And we cooperate. That's the kind of relationships you want to build for your children. And... The prerequisite for that is they have to build important key skills that will help them thrive when they're older. Been free for, arth- from ar- for arthritis from arthritis for at least 10 years. That's from Fishaz. Fishaz, I wish you would have let us know how you did it, but that's uh, great to hear. Congratulations. That's excellent. Uh, I have a busy idea. I have a business idea that I feel will be difficult, but will fulfill me. Tips on executing. Want to move to the Gulf countries from Sweden due to Dean. You have a business idea. You want to you wanna move to the Gulf countries from Sweden due to Dean. Okay. So you have a business idea you want to execute. Guys, this is a, a risk. Guys, it's scary. When you take a risk on a business, I've done it. I've done it many times, and sometimes it worked out well, and sometimes it, sometimes it did, didn't. Business is a scary thing. Business is just like a fight. You're going in there. You're getting into a fight. If you win, it's you score big. If you lose, uh, you lose big. This is what I would tell you. Never go into a business venture that if it went wrong, you can't live with it. If you're going in a business venture, you got to imagine the worst case scenario. Ask yourself, can you live with that? Can you live with it? If the answer is yes, consider 
moving forward? If the answer is no, don't touch it. Drop it. Drop it like a hot potato. Don't ever go into a business venture where if you lose your shirt, you can't live with the consequence. If you're ready to take a fight, ask yourself, if I lose this fight, can I live with myself afterwards? If the answer is no, don't take it. Don't take it. It's not going to fight for you. Whatever the challenge may be, ask yourself this important question. Can I live with the consequences if things go wrong? If the answer is no, don't do it. It's not the right venture for you. We all eat humble pie. I talked about it earlier. We all stumble, but you got to be able to <laughs> be able to pick up and move forward. Okay, so don't go too big. Don't risk too much. Manage your risk. Ask yourself, can you live with things going wrong? <clears throat> How do you build character in adulthood if you were never taught as a child? That's from Bez 11. That's a great question. That's a really, really good question. Guys, I'll tell you something about growing my childhood, okay? And I had a very good childhood that prepared me for adulthood. If I were to look at my father in a defiant way, I would be reprimanded. I never looked at my father in his eye when he was mad at me. Never. And I think that was a good thing. I know a lot of people are like, oh, no, coach. Oh, no. no. You're, I, my, look, I'm, I was raised that way. I'm happy they raised me that way. I feel that it, they did me a favor. They did me a favor. I was raised to do my chores, to do whatever I was, I was required to do, and then I can enjoy myself. And then I can enjoy myself. There's no fun until what you were told to do is done. After that, they leave you free. I do the same thing with my kids. My kids, if their chores are done, I let them play video games. If they, if they did their chores, their workout, their homework, they, I give them money for their video games. They love, they're big gamers, so they want 10 bucks, whatever, 20 bucks. for the, I give it. I give them an allowance. If they didn't do their work, they'd get nothing. There's no... There is no reward without contribution and effort. You have to learn that at a young age. It hurts to learn it as, a, as an adult. It hurts. It hurts. What I would recommend to you is find someone you respect, admire, and try to copy what they do. Try to learn how they go about things. And I'll tell you something. One very important element that I think is always overlooked is having a good moral character. You're doing yourself a disservice. You know, if you if you study the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, they talk a lot about virtue, 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 virtue. And guys, believe me, they were obsessed with virtue. They almost conquered the entire world. People don't make the connection. People, people study Western civilization and they don't make the connection, how they got so successful. If you look at the Muslims, they were super hyper focused on virtue. On Another way to say it is don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. The Christians, hyperbolically obsessed with not sinning. Obsessively so. And they became extremely successful. What does it mean? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. What's the point? That's what makes a person successful. Because long term, if you read... Guys, I'm going to give you guys a, the gist of it. Okay, in the, in the Republic, one of my favorite, favorite books. Arguably Plato's greatest work. Okay, He talks about this Greek fable. Where... This guy discovers a ring. Okay? He discovers a ring, and when he turns the ring, he becomes invisible. So he discovers this superpower. He's invisible. Okay, And now Plato's putting up a dialogue. Socrates is the main character in the dialogue, of course, as always. In 38 of the 40 books, it's always Socrates, the main character. And Socrates is like, well, what should this guy do? You know, He's talking to his interlocutors, and they're like, the guy, as the fable goes, the Greek fable, the guy goes and kills his enemies, sleeps with their wives. Like he does everything most people would do. And Socrates is like, oh, that's really bad. He's shooting himself in the foot. He's shooting himself in the foot. How's he shooting himself in the foot? His interlocutors, Socrates' interlocutors is saying, are saying, no, if you can get away with it, get away with it. It's not cheating if you don't get caught. That's what the modern day <laughs> uh, summary would be. Okay, That's what people say nowadays. If you're not cheating, if you don't get caught, it's not cheating. If you didn't get caught, it's not cheating. Socrates will tell you, no, it is cheating. It is cheating. Why is it cheating? He says this, look, imagine two societies. Another thought experiment. I had a lot of thought experiments today. Imagine two societies. Society A, they're moral. Society B, they're immoral. Society B, me and you live in society B. When you're not looking, I sleep with your wife. When you're not looking, I steal your money. When you're not looking... I slash your tires. Why? Eh, if you're late for work, it makes me look better at the at the company. When you go to, I was on time. 
Look at my neighbor. He wasn't on time. He had to replace his tire. Too bad. I'm sucking up to the boss. I'm getting closer. I'm getting a better promotion than you. In that society where people betray one another, guess what? They start plotting against one another. I know when I'm not looking, you're trying to steal from me. I know when you're uh, not looking, it's time for me to get a little more. When you breed that type of culture, because don't forget the word culture means the collective psyche. The collective psyche is to take what you can when you can. That kid who said, it's not cheating unless you get caught. Well, guess what? He's going to get his diploma and he doesn't have what it takes between his ears to be a good engineer. He's going to go on site. He's going to make a mistake. He's going to get fired. And he thought he saved time and energy by cheating in his test. Well, guess what? In the end, there's always another price, a bigger price to pay. I always tell people cutting corners is the hard way to be successful. Cutting corners is the hard way. It's better to just do the work. You know, guys, uh, uh, Stephen Arkabi, he came out with another book uh, after Seven Habits. It was a really good book. I'm forgetting the name of it now. Uh, I think it was called Pr Primary Greatness. And basically the whole premise of the book is it's, it's easier to actually become a black belt than to pretend to be a black belt. It's easier to become a medical doctor than to try to, to, try to, sh to, try to convince people you're a medical expert. It's actually harder to live a lie. It's harder to be a black belt that doesn't train and has the black belt from 10 years ago and his jiu-jitsu is faded. It's harder to be a successful martial artist than if you just did the work. It's easier to do the work, study the engineering, get on site, be successful, have people knocking on your door because you're the best engineer and they want to work with you than to be the guy who's always trying to lie to people and get them to believe you're good enough. So Socrates is saying, look, in, in this society where we're cheating, lying, and stealing, we're going to be fighting against one another. We're going to be betraying one another. And contrast that with the other society. They don't lie. They don't cheat. They don't steal. They trust one another. They have this synergy. So they thrive. They actually give each other credit, loans, help. They pick each other up. That society is far superior. What happened with this uh, Greek idea of cultivating virtue? They dominated the entire world. Now, I'm not saying... Uh, I'm not saying Alexander the Great was the most virtuous guy, but compared to his counterparts, he was extremely virtuous compared to them. Okay, compared. Say compared with here. When, you know, Alexander the Great was trying to bridge the gap between Greek and Gentile, the, the Xeni, the foreigner, he was creating inter, intermarriage. He was trying to allow for different religions, different ways of life. He was... Cult uh, accumulating the world's knowledge. He was trying to uh, spread the world's libraries. He was trying to promote knowledge and culture. He was, to a certain extent. Now, look, I'm not here to put him on trial. I'm not an expert of his day-to-day -day, uh, regiment, but the Greeks were incredibly successful and had a lot to do with their beliefs and cultivating virtue. There was a lot of other elements, of course. I'm oversimplifying. Okay, They also uh, had a lot of ego involved. They wanted to expand just to show how great they are. Yes, exactly. I agree. There's a lot of that, too. However, they were far more hardworking, strategic, and virtuous than their counterparts. Can you give wisdom full advice for becoming great doctors and recommend books? That's from Kun Fayakun. Uh, look, becoming a great doctor, you got to study medicine. I mean, that's just a, it's a program. You got to get in there and you got to put your full... Guys, if you're in medicine, jump in with both feet. Like I asked myself once upon a time, am I in martial arts? If the answer is yes, I'm jumping in both feet. Yeah, the answer is yes. Okay, I'm not looking back, man. Jump in. Either I'm either going to fly or die, but I'm not looking back. I'm jumping in both feet. I'm going to immerse myself eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, martial arts. I'm not doing anything else. And that's how I'm going to do it. And that's what I did years and years ago. If you're going to be a doctor, decide. Sit in a room, in a dark room. Decide for yourself. What am I doing with my life? What am I going to be? Don't do two things. Do one thing. And then decide, and then go down that path, hell or high water. There is no plan B. We're going full into this path. Decide what you do. Now, you can do jitsu on the side, guys. That's fine. You can be a doctor and do jitsu on the side. You don't have to be like me and jump in both feet. But if you're going to be a doctor, that's that, you can't be a doctor on the side. You understand? You can do jitsu. I asked myself, do I want to do jitsu on the side, MMA on the side, or do I want to jump in? I decided to jump in. Doctor, you can't do it on the side. Okay. Now, you could be like me and read 
books on nutrition and books on you know staying healthy but but that you're nowhere near being a doctor you're never going to be known as a doctor okay but you could be known as a jiu-jitsu practitioner if you're a blue belt purple belt you're you're a legitimate practitioner of course but medicine is a full on lifestyle are you ready to do 10,000 hours in medicine are you that interested are you that passionate about it if no don't even try <clears throat> Fernando Escobar says, bought your underhook made easy, never wrestled before, willing to invest the time. What's the best way to use instructional to learn fast? That's from Fernando. Fernando, get underhook made easy and wizard, um, overhook made easy. Get those three, drill them, drill them, drill them, and then play wrestle. Find somebody who's ready to flow wrestle. Don't wrestle hard. Just kind of play around with the techniques, horse around until they become second nature. The problem with people who wrestle is they go too hard, too intense, they're too ego-driven. Just say, hey, let's flow wrestle, let's play around, we drill these techniques, let's kind of, I'll let you score once, you score on me once, and then just develop the feel, okay? Once you develop the feel and you guys are warmed up, then you could pick up the intensity and gradually increase the intensity. Coach, advice on getting over people's pleasing, over people pleasing and needless, neediness, excuse me. Coach, advice on getting over people pleasing and neediness. That's from us. That's from FZ. What a beautiful pair of initials. Um, FZ, I would tell you, look, people pleasing is the worst thing in the world. Don't be a people pleaser, man. Please. Nobody likes that. Not the person you're trying to please. Not the people watching you trying to please that person. Look, be respectful to people. Be friendly to people. But don't go on your knees. Especially not with women. You know, I see so many uh, friends of mine. <laughs> they find a girl they're in love with and they start behaving in like really absurd ways and i tell them guys uh like i had one of my friends one time we were driving and he's like pull over here i said sure he's like i'm gonna get my girl some flowers I said, well, what's the occasion oh just like that i was like really that's weird and he's just constantly pampering her and dude if you're giving a woman constant flowers you're telling her look i'm trying to bribe you for your love that's one way it can be interpreted not it's not necessarily going to be interpreted, but most women will see it that way. Why is this guy trying so hard? Look, I always tell you guys, the death blow to every single counter to what I say about women is always go look at their romance novels. It's never a guy coming with a box of candy and flowers and cherishing them. No, 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 no. It's always a guy who stands his ground, who's got things going for him, and eventually he falls in love. He's a challenge. The guy's a challenge. Guys, I didn't write, I didn't write these books. I don't sell these books, but you can't say that women lie with their dollars. They can lie with their lips, but at the end of the day, what what do they buy? What do they consume? What really pushes their buttons? And it's the same with every human being. It doesn't have to be men and women because I know that that's a real common common trap men fall in. They find the girl they like and they just start showering her with gifts and they just shower her with attention. That's the wrong way to go about it. It's also true with every relationship. Like I, I enjoy being with somebody because they're friendly, they're kind, they have good character or whatever. Not because they're ready to uh, be needy. You know, that kind of can hurt the relationship. Now, let's say I'm in a room with a world-class black belt. I'm going to show him some extra uh, attention. I might praise that person more, but not because he, because of, but because of his achievements, not because of his, who he is. No, because of his achievements. And I think that's fair and balanced. That's fair and balanced. Like when, when John Denahar comes to town, I treat him like a king. Not because he's my he, he's John Denard, because he trained me for so many years, because I respect his knowledge. I want to spend time with him. I want to learn from him. I buy him dinner. I take him wherever he wants to go. My wife calls me, what time are you going to be home tonight? It depends when he's done. Whatever he's done, whenever he wants to go to sleep, I drop him off and that's it. He goes to bed. That's how well I take care of my trainers. Why? Because I respect them. So I understand there's a, there is sometimes you're going to give people extra attention and prestige, but don't do it on your knees. Do it from a place of respect, you know, friendship, respect. And relationships should be reciprocal. Because, you know, like, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you guys. When I was young, John Denari trained me for free. For free. He never charged me. He trained me for 10 years. Never charged me. But I was there all the time. The guy spent so much time and energy on us. It's incredible. How am I going to thank the guy? Well, man, whenever I can pay his meal, whenever I can pay anything, he, I'll take care of him from A to Z. Anything, if he asks me any favor, I, the answer is yes. Why? I feel I have a debt to the man. Everything I learned from him, I'm still using it today to earn a living. I'm training fighters. I've been uh, learning. I've learned countless things from the man. I can never repay the guy. But all those years growing up under his tutelage, he could have been charging me. He didn't want to hear it. 
You didn't want to hear it. Every time he wanted to pay him, he doesn't want, doesn't want, doesn't want. Not interested. So people pleasing is usually because you don't see yourself as worthy. You got to ask yourself a hard question. What's wrong with me? What can I do to improve myself? Focus on self-improvement. Focus on cultivating your ability so that people, when they get to the table with you, you also have something to contribute. You don't want to be in a relationship where you're the one taking and that you're never, you're never the one giving. It's very important to have this reciprocal relationship. Then your relationship will truly be authentic. <clears throat> How to become well-spoken like Mr. Zahabi in 20s. That's from Dana. Well, Dana, I appreciate that. I'll tell you, Dana, read. Now, when I say read, I really mean audiobook, but it just sounds weird to say listen. I do a lot of audiobook. When you listen or read a lot of books, okay, I'm going to say read because it sounds so weird to say listen, but I, I will tell you 90% of my reading quotes is audio. Sometimes I can't find the book on audio, which sucks because in our modern day and age, every single book in the universe should be on audio. I have to read. But when I read, guys, I only got about one hour before I get tired. I got one hour reading in me. If I have my glasses on, I could do maybe an hour and a half, two hours. And I rarely put my glasses on. I hate putting on my glasses. I hate carrying the things around with me. I hate cleaning them. I hate remembering to have them on me. So I'll find myself so many times on a trip or something. I'm on a flight. I'm reading on my phone. I'm reading on my computer. I didn't bring my glasses. Not uncommon for coach. Guys, I, I wanted to read these questions. Now. I don't even have my, my glasses. I don't even know where they are. If you're reading on a regular basis, you're expanding your mind, you will change as a human being. Guys, I can't recommend reading enough. Recommend, I can't recommend how much you guys should read. Read. It will change you as a, excuse me, as a human being. Okay, guys, what else we got here? Message retracted. That's from Legaldinho. Legaldinho, don't be shy. Uh, super chat missed. No, I think I got them all. Coach, as a man, we must defend our family. If a man in a restaurant insults your wife, calls her a bitch, <laughs> whoa. for example, would you put hands on him? If so, any worry of getting serious trouble with police? That's from Denzel. Denzel, I don't want to announce this, but I'm going to be releasing something exactly would do this topic i don't want to announce it just yet but because then i know people are going to be writing me emails asking me when it's coming out it's coming out soon okay it's gonna take me another month or so to get it uh, done but if a guy were to call my wife that if he's an elderly man i won't touch him if he's a young kid i won't touch him like it, it would really for me to put hands on him it's a very big possibility because that would be really insulting and i hate to promote any type of violence whatsoever guys i really like, it would take a lot. I'm, I'm telling you, like, I know myself. Okay, look, now here, sitting in here in this chair, I'll tell you, no, I wouldn't. I'll just walk away. I would love, I would love if I was that good. Of, I, I would, I wish I was that good of character. The thing is, if you told me he called me that, I would walk away. Yeah. But my wife, man. Look, I would do my best to walk away. Like, I'm telling you guys, I would do my best. But I might put hands on him. I might lose control. I know it's going to cost me a pretty penny. And I know I'm going to maybe do jail time. I know it. But, ah, man, you, you know what it is, how my little brain works? Let me tell you how it works. I think if that guy did that to me, imagine what he does to other people. Let me set this guy straight and he'll be a better human being for the rest of his life. Like He won't go around bullying people like that. It's not because the word hurts me. You know, it's because I know that in the future, he's going to be bullying people. This guy's a guy who needs to be put in his place. And tomorrow he'll be a better human being. I'm doing him a favor. If I put hands on him, I punish him, I'm doing him a favor. Believe me, I've seen that many times. Guys with really bad attitudes, they take a beating, all of a sudden they change as a human being. They're better human beings. I've seen that countless times. The guy was in the, he was dysfunctional. He got a beating and it changed him for life. For life. Ten years later, I see him again. Oh, he's humble, he's sweet, he's kind. He gets it now. His shit stinks. People, you don't don't rub people the wrong way. Have respect for other people. Other people are, are, you know, they need their, they need to be respected as well. They need to feel good as well. It's not just you in this universe. Would I put hands on him? Very, very likely. Very likely. I wish I would say, no, I, words, uh, they don't mean anything to me. I wish I was that good of a human being. I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm not. I would walk away if he's an elderly man. If he's a young kid, I'd be like, hey, you know, like somebody, you know, whoever's, you know, like somebody, you know. Like maybe his dad is around or 
of course, I wouldn't touch any, a minor or anything like that. But when I put hands on a guy who, who was my age and just with a guy with a really bad attitude, if, if you know me, if you know me as a person, like you would be like, yeah, of course, coach is going to teach him a lesson. However, guys, however, I would tell you, try to avoid that as at all costs, fighting at all costs, because you might see that guy two years from then and he's got a gun on him or a knife or that's that's a real worry but the thing is it's like in the heat of the moment I don't know if I could resist write BMX write BMX write it again in the chat I'm gonna look for your comment right now because I can't find it <clears throat> all day has a missed super chat This is from Ozzy. Thanks for your advice, Coach. I have a, I have a proof lesson BJJ next Tuesday. What's a proof lesson? Thanks for your advice, Coach. I have a proof lesson BJJ next Tuesday after doing some research for gyms. As beginning student, I have a lot time to time free, so I should also do kickboxing like two times a week. Um, I have a. Look, I really recommend uh, focus on doing basics. And if you can train twice a day, for sure you're going to take warp speed. For sure. If you can do, let's say, jujitsu in the AM and striking in the PM or vice versa, you'll skyrocket, guys. Training twice a day is is the formula to get really good fast. Like, if you're really looking to get good, focus on training twice a day. Coach, just wanted to say thank you. But if I have one question, it's what do you do? What What do you make of John Searle? You've referred to his philosophy of mind. Love his lectures on philosophy of language. Uh, John Searle, I think he's an excellent philosopher. He's came up, he's come up with actually some very good thought experiments. However, I feel that he's yielded to the materialist philosophers. Like he didn't push his, I, I like to push his examples even further than he does. John Searle, he kind of capitulates a bit because the thing is, you have to understand something about academia today. 95% of them are or not, let's call it 90% are materialist philosophers. They're materialists. They believe that there's a thing out there. It's called matter. Now, I'm going to give you a real, in a nutshell, history of philosophy. It's been disproven throughout the ages, forever. It's been disproven. I, uh, it's been proven that there's, time and time again, throughout the ages, that there is no proof of this thing called matter. I know it sounds weird, okay? But look up George Berkeley, idealism. Look up, uh, look up, if you really, really, look at, Look up Parmenides, his beliefs, etc. Look up Leibniz. Leibniz will be a more modern day uh, rendition of it. There's no such thing. You could look up Kant as well, more modern day. It's easier to understand. Uh, read only commentary on Kant. Don't actually try to read Kant because Kant is impossible to read. Very difficult to read. Read commentary on Kant. Guys, don't make the mistake of buying Kant's works and try to read them. You won't understand anything. Okay? He uses special terms that only philosophers, professional philosophers only read Kant. Look, materialist philosophy has a has a impossible paradox to it matter is a metaphysical claim they're claiming there's no metaphysics and then they're making a metaphysical claim the core of their belief is metaphysical nobody's ever seen matter nobody's ever seen objective matter it doesn't exist it's it's in your head only it's an idea in your head uh, for those of you who, who are really interested in this look up nominalism like coach i'm a nominalist i've never I've never read any works of a materialist philosopher who can get around this. They always just basically say, "Oh well, that's just what we believe." That's at the end of the, that's it's a blind faith. Okay. Now, if anybody with a PhD wants to debate me on this, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to take the mic, have you on this channel, and discuss it in depth. Even though maybe uh, most people are not interested, I'm still interested enough. Even if it's not going to be a wild and super popular podcast, let's do it nonetheless, so I could refer to it forever. There is no materialist philosopher in the world, in, in the history of the world, in the history of the world. Take my, take, the, take these words to anybody. I challenge anybody in the world, but not some layman. I want some guy who's trained in philosophy, trained in logic to come and try to dispute this. There's no materialist philosopher in the world or scientist or anything that ever actually proved matter. Never. It's a concept. It's an idea. It's an abstract belief. 
So their position is that there's no abstract belief. Those don't exist. They're only imagination. And then we ask them, okay, what is the reality of the world? They say matter, chemistry and, and matter, chemistry and physics, basically, the actions of matter. That's all metaphysical. It's all metaphysical. So they, they accept, they, f they found their entire belief on the one thing they try to deny. Now, I've had countless discussions with materialist philosophers. When we get to this point, they just kind of throw up their shoulders and like, yeah, well, I believe it. That's what I believe. One famous uh, <laughs> example of this. Hold on, let me look it up. Let me look it up real quick. I want to get his name right. Let me look it up, okay. Okay, I, listen to these words, okay. I refute him thus. I refute him thus as he kicked a stone. This is one, this is one thing when I read in my textbooks, I laughed out loud. It made me laugh so hard. Listen to this, okay. George Berkeley in the Enlightenment period, he he just said exactly what I said, that materialism is a is a metaphysical claim. It's not true. It's never been proven. It's part of your imagination. Uh, et voila, you're wrong. Materialism does not exist. It has yet to be proven. It's a ghost in your mind. Upon reading this, listen to this. Um, Dr. Johnson's response to George Berkeley's philosophy of immaterialism, so the opposite of materialism is immaterialism, I refute him thus, he said famously. He kicked a stone, meaning I just reject you. He didn't have a counter argument. He just physically kicked, got up. This is the legend. He got up, kicked the stone, said, I refute him thus in the expression that famous that is famous in philosophy. It was Dr. Johnson's response to George Berkeley's philosophy of immaterialism Immaterialism was the view that all that exists are ideas. There is no material substance. Berkeley said, all we can ever know is what's inside our mind. I refute him thus. I kicked the stone. That's what materialist philosophers tell us when we bring them to this junction. They just throw their hands up in the air and I'm like, well, I just believe it. Well, that's a blind faith. You've never, you've, it's a presupposition, meaning you're believing something that has no proof. Oh, well, I... Just decide to be, I can't get around it. I have this deep instinctual belief about it. I have an instinct. It's just, just so easy to say yes to it. Okay, well, you, it's not logical. Okay, we agree it's not logical. If you go to materialist philosophers, they'll tell you, look, it's not logical. We just have this belief. It's not logical. It has no base in logic. Okay, so the whole thing, if your foundation is not logical, what about the rest? Uh, it works. It's pragmatic. It works. It's not necessarily true. But it works. So if it works, that's all we care about, is that our knowledge works. Hey, coach, I'm new to kickboxing sparring, and I have been getting headaches after light, moderate sparring every single time. What can I do to fix this? That's from Solhi. Suhail. Suhail, excuse me. Suhail, I will tell you, neck training. Neck training. Train your neck, okay? Get strong. Look, I've thought about all this before. Get strong and stable neck and work your neck. Because when you're getting hit... Your neck muscles are not strong. What happens is you get tight, tight muscles in your shoulder. Look this up. 80% of headaches comes from tension in your muscles. It's not that you're getting, if you're doing light sparring, if you're not getting hammered, then it's very likely tension in your neck, okay? You're sparring, you're getting hit, it's jostling your neck. Your muscles are not used to being jostled like that. They're holding up your, your, your spine, the neck, the cervical spine. It's too much stress. They get really, really tight because they're overworked. That creates what they call a tension headache. So if you get strong and stable neck, I teach you how to massage your upper traps, light massage, deep massage, and crushing pressure, how to exercise your neck, how to use your, your chin bone as leverage to stretch your spine, to decompress the nerves, to relieve tension headache, train the muscles in your neck like I show in the video, be gentle. Once you strengthen your neck, you won't have these problems, okay? Look it up. Be very diligent do some research most headaches are due to tight muscles in the upper traps shoulders so use the massage exercises i show in the video decompress the spine decompress the neck decompress the spine relieve the muscles build the muscle stronger so that when you spar it's not an overload whenever you overload a muscle whenever something is due to a muscle one reaction is it can become very very tight because it's trying to tell you look stop working me i'm still rebuilding i can't I'm not ready to work Loosen it up, loosen it up, make it stronger so that when you spar, it's comfortable amount of stress. There's a margin of safety. Like I always talk about all the strong and stable program, you have to always work within a margin of safety. If my exercise is a seven on 10, 
And if I want to do it safely, I got to have the ability to, to you, to ha I have to have the ability of 8.5 on 10. I got to work with this margin of safety. Okay. So I don't have overuse injuries. Hope that helps you. Dejan Viking, 499. Well, thank you, sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar, but no question asked. Okay. I got a bunch of super chats here. Salam coach. We need to, we need you back on Joe Rogan for more MMA philosophy and science epic talk. That's from Schiff. Thank you, my man. I look to, uh, next time I'm in Texas, I'll reach out to Joe and we'll hopefully get together. Uh, what else we got here? I got so many super, super chats that come in. Uh, oh yeah, like I was talking about John Searle, I, I just find he capitulates way too much. Okay, here we go. Getting organized. Thank you, Coach, for your, for your advice. What kind of philosophy will work best for doctors for pursuing greatness in the community? Jazakallah khair. That's from Kufa Yakun. Uh, listen, I, I'll tell you something. I don't. Philosophy is a is a desert. It's an ocean. It's it's a massive amount of thinking. People had thoughts thousands of years ago, and they wrote it down. And people wrote commentary on their thoughts, and then people wrote commentary on those thoughts, and it just never ends. People tell me, "Did you hear about this guy?" Guys, it's so massive. It's so massive. You could spend your whole life just studying Plato. Forget Aristotle. Just Plato. You could spend your whole life, of course, in Aristotle. Guys, I read Plato regularly, and I still learn new things. Still, all the time. Every time I read, I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. Do you think he meant, like, it's an ocean. So if you tell me, hey, what part of the ocean is best for a medical doctor? Look, the Arabs, the Muslims were amazing. Amazing. Medical doctors, amazing. They wrote books on medicine that lasted 500 years. Nothing new in 500 years. Avicenna, Averroes, they were brilliant medical experts, brilliant. So I'll tell you something. The Greeks were great mathematicians, not brilliant necessarily medical experts. The Arabs, the Muslims, I shouldn't say Arabs because a lot of them were Persian. A lot of them were other than Arab, okay? Like I'm not Arab. I'm culturally Arab, but I'm not a genetically Arab. But even though I'll refer to myself as an Arab because of the culture. They were phenomenal mathematicians. The Arabs were the greatest mathematicians of all time. I shouldn't say Arabs. The Muslims were the greatest mathematicians of all time. Hindu. Okay, I don't want to leave out the Hindu. The Hindus were phenomenal mathematicians. They were great mathematicians. Okay, but they were also incredible medical experts. So I would say that philosophy is more relevant. Um, the Enlightenment period, of course. These are the three elements. These are the three major areas I've studied. And I've studied other areas, but these are the major three. That's why I always refer to them. That's what I spent 20 years studying. Now, if you ask me about Eastern philosophy, I know very little. Even though I have started studying it, I have jumped in, I know too little. I'll come back to you guys with theories in five years, ten years from now. But it's I know too little to even really comment on their beliefs, okay? Or their understanding or their philosophy. It's an ocean. Eastern philosophy is an ocean. People sometimes get mad at me. Why don't you study Eastern philosophy? Guys, that's an ocean. You're asking me, hey, why aren't you a master chef? Well, to be a master chef it takes 20 years of your life. Why aren't you a pilot? Well, <laughs> I'd have to go to a pilot. I'd have to go to school to be a pilot. Like, it's not that easy to just go in there and learn and, and understand what they're doing. Okay, that's why I always critique Sam Harris because he claims to be a Muslim expert, but he never, notice this, okay? He never debates us. We always ask him. We always petition him. Come and have a talk. Like, that's why I respect Jordan Peterson. He took the depth. He took the he took the jump. He's been interviewing Muslim scholars, Muslim experts, and he's having a dialogue and he's learning. Not Sam. Sam is too much of a dogmatist. He's too hard-nosed. He wants to be like, hey, I have an opinion, but you you, get, you don't get to say a word. This is a one-way conversation. And all the guys I will debate with, they're all my friends and they already believe what I believe. And they're very, uh, you know, they already have this point of view, let's just say. And he's comfortable with that. He knows that it's soft ground and he won't have to. He won't have to really go deep because he knows that he'll get shredded. And I just was listening to a dialogue between him and, and Peterson, and Peterson was saying, "Look, Muslims are not a danger. I'm having, I'm going to be having dialogue with Muslim uh, experts, and I'm going to be dialoguing with them." You know what Sam Harris told him? He's like, "Good luck, good luck." Like, like if we're, if he's trying, if if it's like if Peterson was being told, "Hey, you're going to go speak to barbarians. Good luck. You're not going to get anywhere." Let me tell you something. I listened to all his podcasts. They were beautiful. They were back and forth. Even he even teared in one of them. He was touched. He was, uh, you know, he was moved. At least he's trying to, to bridge the gap between 
the two worlds. And I find that very respectful. Guys, I'm ready to do that with anybody. Like if anybody thinks, hey, coach, there's this other group and they would like to dialogue with you, I would never say no. I'm ready to dialogue with anybody. I have zero discrimination for any group. I will treat people well no matter what group they're with. However, it doesn't mean I have to agree with you. And I understand that people don't agree with me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not living in a, in a cave, my head in the sand, I should say. I'm telling you that I understand the man disagrees with us, but let's get on the table and see, one, how we can live with each other, and two, why do we disagree? Dogmatism is a cancer in this world. What is dogmatism? When you believe you're right and you won't look at counter evidence, you won't even entertain counter evidence, and counter evidence will never change your mind. You're completely closed-minded to anything that possibly disagrees with what you believe. Your mind is made up and nothing will ever change it. That's, that's dogma. Dogma is a cancer into the world. That's why all the world wars you see, all the human suffering, often has, to, oftentimes have to do, has to do with dogma. We're cementing our feet into sand. We're not moving from this position, and nothing will ever make us move. This is a very dangerous and sad element. And so many times, wars have been fought. And generations later changed their mind and what they fought over doesn't matter to them anymore. It doesn't even matter a, 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 a hair. But back then it mattered so much, but it was it was dumb. They fought for nothing because look, the future doesn't care about it. You guys are just living, we're living a dogma. Today, nobody cares about the, like nobody cares about the things people fought over in the past. People fought over the dumbest, most mundane things that today people don't care about. So, look, I find dogmatism is a major, major problem in the world. We all, have, we all suffer from dogmatism to a certain degree. Yes, that's no doubt. I'm not saying I'm dogma-free. No, no human being is, I don't think. But I definitely believe Sam Harris definitely suffers from dogma. <clears throat> Hi, Coach. For another Tim Hortons before Ramadan. That's from Jimmy Earl. Guys, Jimmy Earl is a gentleman and scholar. He just sent me five bucks. That's two. That's two Tim Hortons. I really appreciate that. Hey, hey, coach, any tips for training during Ramadan? That's from AJ. AJ, I would recommend intermittent fasting starting from now. Not Ramadan, obviously. Ramadan, you're fasting. Get used to fasting before Ramadan. So have one or two meals a day. Um, I'm actually coming out with a book on in intermittent fasting for combat sports because there was no book out there on combat sports and intermittent fasting. It's all intermittent fasting for regular people. There's no sport. What do you do if you're a combat athlete or you're... Or you're you're a glycogen, you're in a glycogenic sport and you're an athlete and you need to intermittent fast. I have to experiment, trial and error. It's not complicated, guys. Intermittent fasting is not complicated. It's super simple. Carb up before your practices. If you're training twice a day, you carb up twice a day. I'm going to get into the details in, in the book, but start intermittent fasting. Have one or two meals a day so that when you go to Ramadan, you're ready in the beat. Guys, it takes about 30 days to get used to it. So by the time you get through Ramadan, all you felt was the pain. You didn't ever got, you never, for those of you who don't know, Ramadan's when we fast, all Muslims fast for 30 days, okay? We basically fast from sunrise to sunset, okay? A little bit before sunrise and right at sunset we can eat again, eat and drink. It takes about 30 days to get into the habit. So if you did it for 30 days before, like I'm always intermittent fasting. So when Ramadan comes, it's not such a shock. So start intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting. Have a four or five hour eating window or even eight if you're training to make it an eight hour eating window that way when ramadan comes it's not a huge shock guys this is my coffee i've already done eating for the day i ate breakfast i ate a very small lunch very small i ate a sandwich and this coffee my coffee is not breaking my fast it's four o'clock i finished eating at three so i did 10 to three today why i'm not training tonight i have a project tonight so i'm not able to go and train i eat less when i'm not training i eat one meal for breakfast lunch and that's it no dinner guys you don't need dinner who made up this three meals a day rule with plus snacks who made this craziness up you don't need that much food i want you guys to look down on your belly right now look down on your belly if there's an excess amount of fat you're eating too much your body's telling you look i have so many calories i'll put some in reserve if you look down on your belly right now and you have flab that means you ate too much food it's that simple Lower the amount of food gradually, slowly. You're eating too much. 
You don't need that much food. Now, look, I already started writing this book, and I talk about the first 30 days. The first 30 days is not easy. I talk about how I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You're going to bite the bullet. That's why you want to start fasting before Ramadan, before you get into the to, to the difficult days, because they're going to be even harder now. Because you're after 30 days, it gets easy, but Ramadan's over. You understand? So it's not even really 30 days. Honestly, the first two weeks are the hardest. Changing. Going from hot water to cold water. That's not, guys, I live in cold water. So for me, Ramadan, it's not so hard. Coach, what style of guard passing would you prioritize for a transition from BJJ to MMA? That's from Alex Espinoza. Alex, I really believe in both. Loose passing and tight passing. So body lock passing and loose passing. I'm not a believer in doing just one. I know some guys spend their whole career doing one. And it works. I find that's true for f a small percentage of fighters, either MMA or BJJ. Most guys, average Joes, need to learn both. I am a big believer in learning both. Don't kid yourself that thinking tight passing is the way to go. Some guys, like for instance, you look at George Champier, Jake Shield, they're very good at tight passing. They have certain attributes and make it so. If you look at Hafa Mendez, he rarely tight passes. He's always loose passing. I'm a believer in both, and you'll gravitate to either, either one as you uh, get more experience, okay? If, if you are one of those special case guys. But so many times, like sometimes I, I train and the whole week I'm tight passing and then the next week I can't even get one tight pass. Not even one. I'm always loose pass. Like guys got wise to it. Guys know I'm trying to do it. They, I scored on them last week. Today they're on high. Learn. It changes. The terrain changes. Learn both. There are very few guys that can do what George does and kind of tight pass everybody. There are very few, but it does exist. You got to you know, keep an open mind. So I when I'm doing MMA, I loose pass and tight pass. I do both. Dimitri Campbell says, a 17-year-old signed up to UFC. I can't help but feel envious. I'm 22, Waco National and Provincial, blue, be blue belt and high school wrestler. I know I'm no world, I'm world away from pro level. I'll be come summer, I'll be at TriStar. Uh, guys, a little help with the grammar, please. <laughs> uh, that's from Dimitri. Dimitri, I will look forward to your visit in the summer. Guys, make sure to sign up, uh, stay at the dorms if you can. You're living in basically in the same building as the gym. It makes it very convenient. TSDorms at gmail.com. Check in the link in the description. You'll find the address. Um, what can I tell you? Look, don't be envious. Some guys get there at 17 years old and they're out by 21, 22. You never know, man. I've seen so many super prodigies and they don't last. Some guys make it in their 20s, late 20s, and then they, they're late bloomers. Don't be so envious. Not everybody has the same... Uh, boom at the same time. Guys, I'm telling you, like I've seen guys who are not so good, not so good, and all of a sudden, psh, they have a peak. They understood, it clicked. It happens at different times, at different ages. I've seen 15-year-old guys who look super good, they're so strong, then they meet a roadblock and they're never the same. They have they had a weakness we didn't know about. How many times, I don't want to name names, but how many times were we promised this prodigy? He does super, super well. I don't want to name names. He does super, super well, and what happens? You never heard of him. He had a couple of losses. You don't hear about him no more. Even though he had a few stunning wins. You know, I can name you many guys like this. So, look, it does happen, though. Guys get in young and they stay in there for a long time and they have a brilliant career. It does happen. However, very few of those. Okay, so it does happen, though. Just I'm saying, don't count your eggs before they've hatched. The kid's young. He's doing good. Doesn't mean he's going to be great. And a lot of times when you start too young... You have a lot of overuse injuries. Look at TIE fighters. They retire at 22, 23. Why? They started at 8 years old. Their knee, their neck, their back. They just, their body can't take it no more. <clears throat> Naldo Roca. Hello, coach. I want to thank you for sharing your wisdom on your channel. Do you still recommend kettlebells over barbells for everyone who wants to get in shape? Thank you. That's from Naldo. Naldo, Naldo, I believe in both, okay? But I'll tell you, if you're new, start with kettlebell. Kettlebell will hit more many stone, many birds with one stone, okay? I have a kettlebell video. Check out Strong and Stable Kettlebell. I teach you the top exercise, how to ex them, execute them correctly without injuring yourself. Okay? Super important. Then from that, just start practicing those lifts, okay? Just start practicing them. I especially teach the drop snatch. The drop snatch is super important for developing stability, explosiveness, abs, all in one shot and protecting your knees. It's uh, Guys, a drop snatch is when you shoot the kettlebell up and you 
drop into a split, not a split, but like a lunge, a split lunge, okay? Think about what that's doing. It's training explosiveness. It's training your abs because the weight is on one side. Your abs are flexing. It's training your stability. It's hitting so many birds with one stone. It's creating incredibly powerful legs, incredibly powerful shoulders, incredibly, incredibly powerful abs. It's doing so much. Barbells are slow. Unless you're doing Olympic lifting. But Olympic lifting takes a lot of time and energy to learn. You need an Olympic lifting coach. It's too complicated. The kettlebell, you can do explosive, low-impact plyometrics. Guys, are you listening? If it's low-impact and it's a plyometric, it's a, ma it's, it's a slam dunk of an exercise. Plus, you could do it for reps to build cardio. It's just such an amazing tool. If I had to choose one tool, I would choose kettlebell. If I had to choose one exercise, I would choose sprinting. I would mix those two. If I had those two and you just add me a, a pull-up bar, I'm golden. The barbell is good if you're training professionally and you want to hit, you want to increase your maximal strength, which is much easier to do with a barbell than a kettlebell. You can increase your maximal strength with a barbell, but it's not really a great tool for that. Barbell is good for developing explosiveness, endurance, uh, coordination. It's fantastic for that. If I want to build maximal str strength, I use squat, uh, a box squat. I use deadlift. I use hybrid Olympic lifts such as power snatch, power clean, power jerk. I use band pulls. There are better ways to work your maximal strength, okay? But I talk about that in, in strong and stable uh, knees, okay? How to build maximal strength, why it's important. Doing endurance plus endurance plus endurance will make you weaker over time. You can't just do endurance. You have to go through cycles of maximal strength. Once you reach 1.5 times your body weight, that's plenty. Now I'll go through a cycle of endurance training. And you're always constantly chasing your tail. You're always... When you work maximal strength, your endurance goes down. When you work your endurance, your maximal strength goes down a little bit. And you're always, see so you start here, you're seesawing back and forth as you reach higher levels, okay? But it doesn't do this, click, 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 click. They don't go up together. They go up like this, seesaw, maximal strength, endurance, maximal strength, endurance. And then maximal strength will, maximal strength will plateau for a while, okay? You can't really go much higher than this. And then you just kind of build endurance from there. But you never want to go below being able to deadlift. 1.2 times your body weight, okay? Because then when you're in a wrestling match and you're trying to lift a guy your size, it's 100% of your capability. Okay, guys, no more super chats, please. I got to put this one to bed. My kids are home from school and I got to uh, go and tend to them before going on with the day. Hey, coach, I don't I don't have a car and I... and, and uh, Guys, no more super chats, please. I'm going to round these up and then we're going to call it a day. Hey, coach, I don't have a car and in total, I walk... I'm walking between one and two hours every day getting to and from training. Do you think this will help me? That's from Little Trailblazer. Look, I would jog it back. I would do like an interval run. I would, I would, my cardio would be my way back home. Okay, so what I would do was I, get, I would get a good backpack where I can have not only the shoulder strap, but a strap around my stomach. So that way when I run, it doesn't jostle up and down, so it doesn't kill my body. Okay, I would probably do like 30 seconds run fast. 30 seconds jog. 30 seconds run fast, 30 seconds jog. I'll probably come up with an interval. Okay, so it's anaerobic and aerobic at the same time. I'm bur I'm doing bursts of sprinting. And by sprinting, I mean 70 to 80% of your capability. And then I'm doing bursts of jogging. Well, not bursts, but so bursts of sprinting, then jogging. Bursts of sprinting. I would probably do that 10, 15 minutes and walk the rest of the way home as a cool down. So I would use my commute to, to and from the gym as a uh, conditioning tool. Now, on the way there, I'd probably just walk it just so I can save my glycogen and save my stores for when I'm actually training. But instead of staying back behind in the gym and running on the treadmill or doing airdyne, just go home and make your commute home, your run. Salam, coach, when are you coming to Belgium? That's a great question, my man. I have some friends from Belgium, some new students that came. I just gave somebody a purple belt that came from Belgium. He's been training with uh, Pierre-Olivier Leclerc, one of my students, and he was doing really, really well. He brought him in from Belgium to test him out at the gym. I was really impressed with his. Uh, so shout out to Maximo. I'm pretty sure he's listening to this. Very, very solid purple belt. We decided to promote him here in, in Canada, and he's traveling back and forth from Belgium to Canada to get his uh, future belts as well. Very strong jiu-jitsu in Belgium. I can't wait to show up there one day and hang out with you guys. Also, I, je parle français, so we can talk. You know, Belgium, they speak a lot of French. So um, definitely, next time I'm in Europe, I'll try to connect with the people of Belgium. What do you think of Philly Shell defense? That's from Nabil. I like it. It has its place. It's not the end-all, be-all, but it has its place. I like it. 
in Muay Thai, we kind of cross block. I call it more of a cross block because Philly shells when your hand is more down. I like it. I use both. And uh, like everything else, it has its place. Guys, please, no more super chats. Jabid Rahman, thank you. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, let's see here. Guys, I'm bombarded with super chats. Please, no more. Shif, ever had any jinn or supernatural experience? No, I've never had a jinn. Guys, for jinn, it's like spiritual. Uh, um, I would say, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, like a like a not not demon, but spirit. Uh, no, I've never had an encounter with a spirit. Uh, okay, here it is. This is the one I missed. Salam alaikum. I'm five feet and six. I am five feet and six point nine inches. Okay, five feet six. Okay. Uh, this is from Achinjo Shabab. How should I fight taller guys? And how, what should I do? Train Barakufik, suffering from insecurity. Brother, when you're five foot, uh, 6.9, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's shorter than average, but listen, you got to build your athleticism. It doesn't matter if you're five foot six. Look at Andre Volkanovsky, uh, uh, Volkanovsky, Alexander Volkanovsky. I don't know why I call him Andre. Forgive me. Alexander Volkanovsky. Doesn't matter. How tall is Alexander Volkanovsky? Let me look it up. Ah, one point six meters. What is with this? Five foot six inches tall. He's five foot six inches tall. That's per Wikipedia. Okay. You, my brother, are five foot six inches tall. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Volkanovsky feels short? No. No, he doesn't. Okay, it doesn't matter that he's short. It's all about being a beast. It's all about being a beast. Take what you have and make the most of it. Make sure that people will know that you're not five foot six in your mind. Build your body, build your endurance, build your capability. People will respect you, your physicality, if you can box, wrestle. I would go full blast MMA. You need a more look. When I was young, I was shorter than everybody. That's why I was so obsessed with martial arts. I was bullied. And short everybody. It was a it was a benefit to me because it made me crazy about martial arts. It made me psychotic about martial arts. I'm constantly watching fights. I'm constantly studying new. I'm I'm so immersed in it. Why? It's that little kid in there doesn't want to get beat up. It's that psyche that you develop when you're young. Take that as motivation. Guys, I'm a big believer in being physical, meaning training your physicality, training your mind, and Making money is important, guys. Making money is very important. Okay, but I don't want to get into. But train your mind. Don't be a guy who has nothing between his ears. You won't get the full experience of life. It's very important. Okay, you make time to cultivate your mind. Reading books, learning new ideas. Make time. And make time for your physicality. Hit the bag, work out, kettlebell, sprints, whatever it may be, wrestling, boxing, play basketball, like make sure you take care of your physical body. Don't let that don't let that fall by the wayside, but you'll regret it. You'll get old quick. Your experience in life will be dimmed. You'll have a you, you won't have as much joy and pleasure in life. Okay? The body, the mind, great source of pleasure. Use them both. Keep them healthy and strong. You will miss them when they're gone, my friends. If your knees are gone, if your health is gone, then you'll be like, hey, remember when I used to be healthy? Oh, remember when I didn't have this disease? Remember how life was so enjoyable? You're going to be reminiscing about the good days. Okay? Don't let that be you. Take care of your body. It's your most important possession. Cultivate the mind. And guys, I will see you all in the next episode. Thank you.